All right, so we'll just jump right into it and let's talk about how you, the transition of taking over the North Texas, the drumline specifically. Uh, when I first got there, uh, I was a graduate student and uh, came and, and you know, was able to go to school due to like an out of state um, tuition waiver and that was part of a scholarship. Were you there as uh, a jazz studies? No, master? Oh. I was just a percussion performance okay. you know, graduate degree. I had gotten a degree from Indiana, Pennsylvania uh, in music education and then I was just, you know, it seemed like the logical step to go and get a performance degree, sort of round out my education. Uh, and I, ha I had drum, I had done drum corps, um, which is another long story about how I got into that because I, I didn't start out that way. It wasn't, it wasn't like my parents did drum corps. I, you know, I it was a part of growing up, or I knew a lot of people to do it. It was I got to it a little bit late, but I had um, been a, you know been a drummer and musician my whole time up to there. But then. Uh, you know, the, the, the indoor percussion thing was relatively new. Uh, it was, you know, in the mid 80s, essentially, uh, at the Percussive Arts Society. And it was a very clever um, way to use marching percussion um, outside of marching band and drum corps. And so uh, I found it to be a really great opportunity to write music and to design things because uh, when I was an undergraduate there was no there was no percussion instructor doing the marching band at all so it was entirely student run there was one band director and the entire thing was student run so that was really when I cut my teeth I had to write all of the the music me and and very uh, few other guys I, I eventually wrote a ton of music for the marching band as a student and that was a, a great opportunity. I mean, it was really unique, and uh, I kind of cut my teeth on that and learned how to do it and, and, and really loved doing it. And so when I got down to North Texas, I was in it for, um, you know, part of the studio for a semester, and it was the, very, the second semester that I pretty much uh, became the, essentially the graduate student who took over that uh, and eventually kept doing it. Um, I found it to be a really great outlet. Uh, I, I found it very comfortable to both write for it and to teach in that environment. I find drum corps is, is it's like a really comfortable thing for me to teach in. It's like a laboratory or a, a group lesson. Uh, and I'm very, I just am at home teaching in that environment. And it's, uh, yeah. And the per person in charge was Dr. Shatroma and he allowed me to pretty, pretty much total freedom to to pick the program to design what I wanted and to do it I mean it was really really um, really easy to work there I imagine um, like drum corps you got to experiment quite a bit because you have you have mm -hmm. players right you have people that can play and so you can kind of do what you want and just to see like I don't know how this is gonna sound but let's just try it and if you don't like it you get to do something else yeah, there was there was uh, uh, relatively uh, the new frontier sort of like anything was game, and we tried everything. You know, we tried to um, if I could if I liked it or if I could think of it, whether it be the style of music or what it is we wanted them to play or anything. If I just simply liked it and thought of it, we would do it. There was no other filter than that. It was simply it didn't go have have to go through like this big huge chain of approval. Um, if I if I liked uh, a Bartok string quartet, we did it. If I liked, um, you know, some kind of new age jazz tune, we yeah. would do that. If we, you know, yeah. a steps ahead tune or um, short ride in a fast machine or, you know, whatever it is it, that, that worked, it would just, that's all it took, you know. So after, after winning PASIC so, so many times, do you ever see the anti drumline going back? If the, I guess uh, if the format changes. Yeah, we t we tend I tend to bring a small group as often as I can, almost every single year. Um, it's rare if we don't bring anybody there. So, in other words, the 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 snare line or the quad line specifically yeah. would put together a small group and compete in what they would call the small ensemble, right. college ensemble. Yeah. And I think that's right now in terms of where we're at um, financially. It's a tall order to bring 
you know, a, a 17 foot truck sure. full of equipment and a bus and, you know, Indianapolis, which tends to be the home of all things, right? <laughs> DCI and BOA and PAS, everything is up there. And it's no small trick to get to there from yeah. Texas. And so um, having a small ensemble do it is much more realistic. It's more, and they've been really successful. They've, they've oftentimes come in first and second in the same contest, so. So being right in the mix um, at NT and teaching a lot of students, is there something that you feel that maybe young students in high school, that before they get to you, you wish that they spent more time doing this? You know, it's evolved so much that it's, it's hard to generalize. Um, especially for me, having a perspective from a different part of the country uh, coming down here and seeing the investment in music education in Texas is it's it's pretty impressive when you first get down here it's it's really different uh, there's been a, there's a real concerted effort to to train students and get them at an advanced level right now I see I see a freshman auditioning for college that play at a graduate level on a regular basis where that was not the case so um, you know, the question is whether there's still one missing link or anything. I, I don't know. I think that way, the way I learned to play music, I think, was unusual. I learned to uh, play first and then read second. And I'm not advocating not reading music <laughs> in any way, but I'm saying I learned that way. And I'm, I look back on it. I'm very grateful that I did. I have... Uh, I can play and there's an internalization or sort of an authenticity with the way I play that often comes with somebody that learns by rote. Um, and it, 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 it's easy to communicate. In other words, the music is the sound and the notation represents the sound as opposed to um, a, a really academic way to approach it is by looking at the music and the written music causes them to play. I don't know if that makes sense, yeah. but it, it ends up being a, a sort of a impersonal filter there that I guess that would be the answer to the question, which is to get to that point where it sounds completely authentic, like somebody is a natural musician and sort of like an actor plays a part and they know their lines, but they still have the cue card there in case they forget, just to remind them what it should sound like. Uh, instead of reading each word on the cue card. Yeah. I think that would be the final step that some younger players need to make. So do you think that, um, because like you're saying, the, the music is there, it has its intent, but at some point you want the player to have their own voice. Yeah, they have to own it and interpret it in a personal way. Uh, and I am, the older I get, the more I appreciate that. Um, I, you know, I think there is a certain... Um, desire for people to have uh, players play exactly what's written on the page and really interpret it the same way and everything. I, I appreciate individuality in terms of the way somebody will play something. I have no qualms if somebody is convicted about what they're doing to interpret it in a slightly different way, adding a dynamic here or there or taking it at a slightly different tempo or a rollantando or, you know, I, I really, um, I totally encourage that. I think that's the way to get to that individual voice that they need. Obviously, the written yeah. music is... It's like a roadmap. It's the blueprint. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, the yeah. guideline, and you can't stray too far off the right. path. But you should, you should make it your own when you're playing something. So what about uh, auditioning at Vanguard? Like, because that's... I don't want to say it's more regimented, right? Because it's, it's marching percussion. But how do you... What do you look for in, in players? Well, when it comes I think to when it comes over to the years, I've definitely tried to create a totally different culture. And that is a culture that is going to attract uh, the best players that we can attract. And that means sometimes it, it really means a college music major that's on the path to becoming a professional musician. I wanted to make sure that what I was doing with the program fell in line with that you know like like everything that you thought it should be coming from the perspective of a future professional musician everything you thought it should be is what it is 
and and there's it's there's a, a an understanding that this is going to help you go in the place you want to go instead of being uh, an idiosyncratic sort of um, specialized thing that you do that doesn't really apply to anything else. I think we, you know, we have a culture now where, you know, well over 90% of the people that we have are college age music majors. And I think that's, that was the goal is to set out to attract those people to yeah. the program. I'm, and it's created an advantage, but like you said, you, you created the culture to, yeah. for that kind of ground. Like if you were a marimba player, yeah. you'd want to go there, you know, or if you were a, 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 a snare drummer, this is where you'd want to play. Because, because of the way we do things and the way we, you know, the way we play, the level of excellence, the, the manner in which we rehearse, the expectations, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. So. What about, um, so talking about arranging, because, you know, you've heard many people say, like, when they hear your group, say, they can tell. They don't even have to see them playing. They can just hear it. They know it. A lot of it's based on well, tuning, but arranging as well. And so... What do you, like, what's the process for you when you say, okay, this is what we're going to do, and you're, you have a blank slate? Well, I'll tell you, that's a, that's a loaded question, and there's a lot to it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's the result of a, a lifetime of study. Like I told you, uh, I started writing music when I was a teenager, yeah. you know, so the experience and the things that you learn along the way you know, it's just like, it's experience. You know, I, I sometimes will say with quantity comes quality. You know, there was, a, you know, a funny story when I was writing music a lot, you know, I would have, I would, first of all, it was with pencil, right? And so I would have this big jar, this old apple cider jar that was really a large sort of jug. And I remember thinking, that if I could fill that jug up with pencil shavings, then I would sort of know what I'm doing, <laughs> you know? And uh, sure enough, I filled it up. And that was probably 25 years ago. And, and uh, so there are so many things about composing that are, it's, it's hard to describe. And there's, there's, very, fi there's very few, um, regulations or textbooks or things that you can follow it's so it's so um it's got such variety to it and it's so unique every circumstance in terms of which you there are certain principles of design and principles that are fundamental in terms of composition mm -hmm. that i've tried to do so i've tried to study composition um just just generally not with drum corps just generally you know i've read a lot of composers letters and i've studied composition and so I don't try to do anything other than that. I try to write in a way that I would write for anything in terms of any medium or anything. Because it's drum corps and because it's that kind of situation, I don't do... There are certain things, I guess, that I would accommodate just from reality of knowing what I have to do in the environment. But it's nothing that I would do differently than if I was given an assignment to... Uh, write a marimba concerto for a wind symphony. You know, there's certain parameters, certain limitations in which you would work within. You know, yeah. it's a concerto. Here's the instrument, here's the style of music. Commit to some kind of thematic, you know, subject matters and you know, whatever. And I, and I think eventually you chip away and, and um, your, your knowledge helps you, helps inform your decisions, right? As a composer and arranger, it's very easy to be indecisive because it could be anything, right? When that's the worst, the, the worst assignment is when somebody just wants something and they're not clear about it. And they just want something good and then you ask them, you know, specifically what they want. And, and then they go, no, no, I trust you, right? I'm sure it'll be good. Well, you know, it could be anything. And then that, <laughs> that tends to to lock you up and so what I've done over time and in experience is figure out ways to inform my decisions to help make clearer decisions um, you know just the myriad of things that you think about voice leading voicings orchestrations density of rhythm harmonic progressions I mean it's just endless and I think that 
like I said, I've always been comfortable in that environment. Writing for marching percussion has always been um, comfortable for me. I'm not going to say easy, yeah. but I'm going to say it's been very, I feel at home doing it. Do you feel that the infiniteness of it keeps, keeps it, like keeps the discovery mode on always because there's... You know what, what helps, and I, and I really am very sincere about this, I, I love it. And I love hearing, you know, I love hearing like a real clean snare line. And I love hearing keyboards do what they do. And I love the combination of the ensemble. And I just love the sound of it. Yeah. I just think it's fun. No, it makes sense. Because Dave yeah. and I, it's, you know, we're, when you guys would hit the Texas show, we're, oh, we're in the midst of drum camp and, right. and all that stuff. And it's just like, oh, and then you're, you know, you're at the end of the week, your brain's fried. And then we go watch the lot and we just hear it. And it's just like. Yeah, all right, we're ready. Let's go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's motivating for me, too, honestly. Yeah, awesome. So. Okay, so with that, um, everything you write, I know, you, like, it's purposeful. You have a reason for it. So talk about duts, the use or <laughs> lack of use of duts. I, I, I'm very aware that sometimes uh, talking about this stuff, you can sound uh, old school or preachy, and I don't mean to at all, but I've, I had never found it that necessary to use them really it wasn't like a conscious decision of like no we're not going to dud here it really wasn't it wasn't a situation like that at all it was like all of a sudden it became very common and it was a little surprising to me because the way i write music and the way that i understand timing uh, i can write in a way that makes dudding a little bit less necessary now, granted, it's 2020 and, you know, you're, you will be in a position visually that makes it impossible sometimes sure. to use the music. But a lot of times the music itself is the duts. And one, one thing that my players do is they understand the music. And they not only know their part, but they know the parts that they relate to. And they know the context in which they fit so they can use the other parts to help them come in. And so, by definition, when somebody's dudding, they're not really listening, are they? They're, they're almost, to a, to a T, they are basically blocking things out and dudding themselves in. And I think that's kind of unusual for us to ever do that. It's, you know, we use the music to help us get through the production you know so when you're I imagine it's a it's a never-ending process but it's especially a two-part process right because when you're writing and not uh, you don't have drill or anything you're writing you're keeping that in mind and then obviously depending on where you end up on the field then you make adjustments there as well like you're not afraid you're you're certainly not afraid to add stuff or take stuff away to make it all yeah I am I am um, I, I don't want to say that it's entirely due to the visual production because I don't think that's true at all. I mean, we, what, one thing that we, you know, what, what we do and what I do in terms of rehearsals is we, we arc it up, right, as a percussion ensemble. And I make sure the music sounds exactly the way it should. The way that the, in, the intended nature of the music is we realize that and we get it to that point. Um, the next step of the equation, and, and so by saying that, if, if it doesn't work exactly the way I want it to work, I change it right there. I'm very quick to it. I'm very easy to, um, you know, to realize that and to act on it. When I was 22, I don't know. I think I would have hung on to licks <laughs> and hung on to things and fought for them to be there. But now I, I guess I'm much more quick to, to realize what it needs to be in the moment. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that I grew up um, in the context of improvising and jazz and playing by rote. And make, you know, I'm very comfortable like making a change right then, asking a, a marimba player to do this, and expecting them to do it. And I actually, you know, I actually think that the players enjoy that too. I think they find it a challenge to to sort of like have me just throw something out, and then expect to do it in the moment right then without going back and writing the score and cutting apart and none of that. It's just, we just do it in the moment. And that, so, so the implication too is like, once you put it on the field, the one thing that I am totally aware of is that drill designers are completely different. Some drill designers, you don't have to do that at all. 
some some people interpret the music visually and it just works and it's just like this last couple of years man i just rarely had to, i didn't have to change much you know it just it just seems smartly designed and some some uh visual designers have a vision in mind like they have a real thing that they want to have happen and the music will have to be changed for that and i i'm okay with that too as, as you know as long as somebody has the vision and you're not just changing stuff to change it if somebody i i think that's true too in terms of the way i approach the design thing let's say there'll be um you know a handful of designers if somebody is really convicted i tend to default to that or if i have a real vision of like no guys i know this is going to work i know uh, you, you'd be surprised how everyone will sort of gravitate to, and you know if if you have enough conviction in what you're saying to like put it out there and say no i think we need to do this then there's something to that somebody has an idea and so that germ of an idea i think you, you you can take that and support it and go with it if somebody visually says you know what i got this great idea we're gonna you know we're gonna ride unicycles throughout the right i mean if and they can see it happening in their head well sure let's let's support that idea let's figure it out you know <laughs> but visual designers tend to be uh, a lot different you know some people um it goes through a process and i kind of joke about this and this once again this is this is uh this is harder to take when you're younger because you, you, you know you want your when when you're younger at least me it's like you you want to be more controlling over what's going on when you get older collaboration seems to be much easier you know there's a security and you know you've done so much that it's it's almost inviting to do something different or sort of meet the challenge of what somebody else wants yeah and so you know it's i don't know i i just think that if somebody has the idea and the conviction you can you can go in that direction but typically what happens is you 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 create the music to inspire the visual idea which in turn causes you to change the music. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like that is a reality in the world we live in. I really do. I think that's that's a true thing that happens. So, the visual guys mainly want to hear something. Let's let's hear it. What are you thinking? You know, let's get it out there. And so usually what happens all um, you know, we'll we'll get together, we'll collaborate, we'll we'll figure out the music guys will get together and we'll come up and then I'll like it's not uncommon for me to make a cut tape of the original stuff and say what do you think about this and that usually gets the ball rolling creatively for the visual guys and they'll say and that will lead in turn to something happening which will cause us to change the music which you know what I'm okay with and before you you know I think people are still learning mm -hmm. they tend to stick to you know like put the stake in the ground and be really matter of fact about you know we have to do this or anything i i kind of en enjoy the the evolution of the process now yeah you know the I, yeah, it's never going to be a straight line there it's always going to be yeah like some people say the word organic which is a little over overused yeah. but yeah like yeah there's a couple steps to getting there and you got to there's a give and take and you know i i don't mind that i think it's good so you talk about how I think the quality in which your groups play softly is second to none. And so I know that, you, that there's an emphasis on that. Well, I, you know, <laughs> it's funny because uh, I learned how to write music in the context of playing softly. Like when you talk about the early um, experiences I had at North Texas with the indoor group, I mean, you're playing percussion inside and you got like 40 people, right? <laughs> And so I was really completely aware that it could be too loud, right? And it would be uh, easy to blow the place out or whatever. So it was always a challenge. It was, you know, it was part of the, the solution to the puzzle was figure out how to play in a way that was subtle and you didn't know it wasn't overbearing and it was within reason inside and all that. And I, I remember when I first went to the Phantom Regiment, I had to learn how to write loudly which was a new thing for me, you know, to all of a sudden be playing and you can't even hear the percussion. 
And so I learned how to orchestrate in a way that would, would take it over the top and volume wise. And, and, and so I've had each end of the spectrum in terms of learning what, how to do what. But I think it's a, I think with regard to percussion in any context, let's just use like, um, you know, cla like symphony orchestra auditions. You know, the, the, all of the main excerpts are, are basically testing who plays softer the best. It's more difficult to play softer, right? Yeah. And I think we've somehow in drum corps, and I'm not trying to be too critical, right, I think right. this is a fair comment, is now that to talk about dynamic range, all of a sudden it's just who can play the loudest. And, you know, I'll play that game. Sure, I'm fine with that. You know, we can... <laughs> But it seemed to be it seems to be unusual where where a long time ago it used to be who could be the more subtle and more soft and you know yeah. and now it seems to be like the range of dynamic expression now includes you know maybe maybe we're not so concerned about being so soft maybe it's just like who can create more effect louder and bring it over the top so we we we've sort of kept it I think. I think one of the things that I value is playing our instruments. And once again, I think in the context of current drum corps and percussion, we can't mistake the word clarity for not playing or for only one thing to be happening. Certainly that's clear. When you have one thing happening, it's totally clear. I get it, right? But I think I, as a composer, as somebody that's done this for decades, I, I want people to play, you know? I like when they play. I like, <laughs> right? I, you know, I, I think it's, it's fun to hear them play more, but be completely supportive and be able to craft it in a way that it doesn't get in the way. And I think that's always a, a welcome challenge for me, you know, to keep playing, but you know, yeah. it, it, let's say we have a context musically that you would, you would find it very easy to not play. I always ask myself quickly, like, what could we play that would be clever and creative that wouldn't interfere or, or get in the way of the integrity of the music that's being played? And I always find that a challenge, and, you know, we've found ways to do that. Sure. So, so with having so many, creating the culture where so many music majors want to come play for you, and drum corps is still a competitive activity. How do you combine the two? How do you combine teaching someone something over a course of the summer, education, while right. doing competition? Well, I think competition is a good thing. I really do. I mean, I, I'm a sports fan, and yeah. I, I like competition. I think one thing that I've learned as a teacher, comp competition makes students try harder. It totally does. I mean, if it's if it doesn't matter, then they're 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 going to try, but they're not going to try like if their life depends on it, right? And if it if it all is coming down to it, you know, if you're in the Super Bowl, you're you're trying every minute, yeah. you know. So the effort level is directly linked with competition, I think. And so, I think. Um, I think I just value education to the point where, where I don't sacrifice that for the competition. I trust the fact that, you know what, if we play, if we play at that level, at that super high performance quality, then we'll be successful competitively. Um, you know, and it, it's, an, it's an opinion game that we've, we're playing yeah, here. It's people's sure. opinion, you know, they, people may like it. I try to make sure that it's the objective things that are really covered, like the performance quality, the accuracy, the, you know, yeah. the, like the, the things that you... Those are very black and white. That's right. together. That's yeah. not together. Or. It, you know, the subjective things about uh, the, whether the taste of what you're doing or the style of music or whatever, you know, that's... People are going to like it or not like it, yeah. you know. But I always make sure that, that I like it, and I try to make sure that I totally focused on the process and not necessarily the end result. If you like the daily grind, then things are going to be okay. And I, I try to make the rehearsals 
and the preparation and all that enjoyable. I try to like make the daily rehearsal fun yeah. and productive. And I think educationally people appreciate it because they always feel like we're making progress and getting better. They're not stagnating, waiting for the next con uh, contest. Sure. They're not like treading water until when it really counts, which is at the show. Well, I've tried to create a culture where it always really counts, right? Instead, of, let's just say this, like we're preparing for a contest or a competition, and what is typically said by instructors is, you get to the contest, right? Somebody says, Daniel, don't worry about a thing. It's just another show. It's just another day. Just right. When you full well know it's not just another day. It's like a right. Yeah. It's a show. It's a big deal. And so we try to make I've tried to reverse engineer that and made sure that I make a bigger deal out of the moments that could would easily be not a bigger deal. Like we make rehearsals like there'll be moments in the rehearsal where I'll set up, I'll, I'll talk and I'll create the situation and get the adrenaline going and get the, you know, get the anticipation going, okay, this is the one. And they, they rise to that occasion in the rehearsal so that when we get to the biggest performances, they actually <coughs> can recognize the way they feel when they do that. And so it's not a total shock. The thing that would be tough would be for you never to have felt that and then all of a sudden you get to the show and you're like what's going on you know this there's is two videos that come to mind one is when jimmy johnson was coaching the cowboys he was with chris i think it was chris bono who was a kicker and he was like all right three seconds to go cowboys down by two right need the field goal to win you know he in practice right yeah and then he makes it, he says cowboys win and then there's another video it's a, a quad cam at one of the rehearsals i don't know what year and you come out to talk to the drum line and you're like hey you know you got to imagine yourself like you're in the stadium tonight. Like if yeah. you got to jump up and down and get the heart going before we start, then do that. And, and you talk to them about that. All right, just two things. Remember, try to make it feel realistic. It's in your best interest to try to make it realistic. You know what I mean? Just jump up and down a little bit right now. You're excited. There's a crowd. I just want it to be no surprises. You know, I think, you know, it's I'm willing to, if somebody it makes a mistake or whatever, it is no big deal to me. I just want to make sure that I've, uh, nobody's surprised. You know, nobody's like shocked at the, the fact that there's 30,000 people there or the fact that it really counts or, yeah. you know, somebody's like kneeling down looking at every mistake you make. I mean, that's part of it. And so you need to prepare for that. You know, that's the goal. Yeah. That's what you're, you know, it's not all about just sort of hiding away in a rehearsal and feeling good about what you do. It's about knowing that that's going to be its sure. performance, you know? So. so I heard a great story about Drumline the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate uh, on the story? <laughs> the fish that got away. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I, when I was younger, I can't remember when this was, when it obviously, it, but it was, you know, honestly, it was several years before that movie came out. I received a number of emails from this guy, <laughs> right? And it was like, hey, we got this project, we're doing this thing, and it's really going to happen. And at the time, I remember thinking, you know, like, you know, drum corps and, and this whole thing we're doing, it's so, it's so hidden and such a cult-like thing sure, that yeah, not yeah. everyone knows about it. And, we're, and I remember him saying, we're going to make this movie. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, right, whatever. I completely dropped the ball. I just like, I thought, no way, this is not going to happen. This is kind of like, right? And so I never really <laughs> followed up on it. And then years later, drumline the movie. I'm thinking, oh, my. I so now every, every email like that comes around, I'm totally responding. Yes, I, I definitely have learned that lesson. Yes. You know, I've never seen that movie. Yeah. Dave bought it for me one Christmas on Blu-ray, and it's still in the wrapper. I have never <laughs> seen it. Well, just the, you know, it, it, I guess ultimately it does make a fascinating... Like somebody should eventually do a, a movie about drum corps, you know, and sure. the psychology, the performance psychology behind it and the whole intensity of preparation. I mean, it's such a, they did a documentary type film. I haven't seen, I just saw the previews for the, I remember Madison, it's a couple of years ago. Yeah. Where they like followed somebody or a group of people in the core on tour. 
I think I, I think I would have a different perspective if I would do the movie. That's, what would it be? Well, I mean, I think I would really take it from, I would have a holistic approach. I would take it from everybody's angle. Instead of taking it from just like some, some random player in the group, I would, I would make sure everyone like saw the whole picture, like the umbrella behind, you know, over the entire thing, like the design process. You know, the volunteers, the organization, the, the way it gets down the road, yeah. the performance quality, the intensity, the, you know, the, the, the pressure on the players. I think that's one thing that is hard to explain sometimes. We, you know, these guys that are playing right now, they don't play a single note that's not videotaped. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's really like there's never a moment where you can just sort of like hide away from the world and just get your act together. And that, but I'm telling you, every from the moment they get off the bus, the moment they play their first notes in the warm up, it's all recorded. It's all pressure. There's people there all the time, and, and it's on the internet, 20 minutes. Yes, and there's there's a pressure involved in that whole thing. That's part of it. That is unlike anything else. And I think any kind of film or documentary should kind of try to capture that. And it's hard to capture that. That's true. Can you imagine like NBA having their practices video? Like and put yeah, out or there? any like, sport, yeah, you know, any any kind of intense thing that's competitive. There's you have to you have to sort of get behind closed doors and really get your act together and come up with your plan and everything and then compete. Now it's just like it's with the internet with the access. Yeah, it's all available all the time. So can you talk about how? Because um, at Vanguard you have a lot more say and involvement and influence in the music you play. Right. Um, so can you talk about how that, it's, I'm it's, sure it influenced your decision to, to go ahead and go to Vanguard. Right. Um, it was uh, technically the position is music coordinator. And so essentially, uh, it, it, it by no means is it a um, one person decides everything sure. thing at all. It's a, it's, a, it's a team. There's a design team. And there are people involved in making decisions and discussing things and everything. But I felt like um, there is a certain amount of decision-making power that after a, you know, after a certain amount of experience, that seems like, like a logical step. It's, it's, you can tell that I'm, I'm um, trying to be reasonable about it. I mean, I'm, I definitely don't take a position like that in, in assuming that people just need to do what I tell them to do at all. It just means that your, your voice has, has weight to it and you can, you can chime into the conversation and have a, a, you know, somewhat of a decision-making responsibility. Yeah. It just it seems like a logical progression, you know? So in 2015, you, I mean, all the lines, they're all great. But in 2016, it's just like all of a sudden the amount of demand <laughs> and craziness happening right off the bat uh the forces of nature show after the after the snares do the th things with their hands they come out and there's like this snare lick that's just it's like right immediately in your face Well, I. Are you saying that's unusual? Or well, that, no, no. It, it seems to me like there was there was a hard turn there, and ever since then, it's just been like, well, pedal you know, all the way down yeah. and let's go. <laughs> and it's you know a lot of it is 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 planned and strategic, but there there is a certain amount of like human nature to the whole thing, and just like we're all we live in the moments. Uh, you know, and a lot of times what's being written is a result of previous experiences and you learn what works and what doesn't work and you learn, you know, there's certain amount of, um, 
if it doesn't go your way one year, then you kind of get back on it, you know, and you just start to go the extra mile and, and really um, try to work as a person, you know, the more I can do behind the scenes to help them, then the more I'll do, you know. And sometimes, um, like I said, I've always been a fan uh, of listening to all that stuff. And I like when it's super exciting and unexpected and sort of, you know, catching people off guard and, and you know, and they're, you know, they're just waiting to see you play and then they kind of are blown back and wow, you know, and I like, I like to sort of construct those moments and try to figure out how to do that. But there came a point, probably this is more to your point, which is there came a point in drum corps where less is more is, was valued. You got penalized for playing too much. I remember this in the mid nineties, like, like taking it on the chin for playing too much or playing some, right? Yeah. And it seemed to be less is more restraint, right? It's all maturity. that sophistication, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And then, it, then, you know, like all things in the world, you know, the pendulum swings and it seems to be like, let's take it to the next level. Let's turn it up to 11. Let's figure out, <laughs> right? How to push the NOS button and just go. And I think that, uh, it's been fun for me to kind of experiment with what the players can play. It's great. I love it when I can come up with something and the player going, what's this? You know, like a four lit sort of paradiddle thing. And you're right. And, and they're trying to figure out how it fits into a bar. And I, I like that because I like challenging them because the players are so good that it's always kind of makes me feel right. If they, if they have to stop a minute and think about what the heck is this, you know? And so, um, yeah, I think it's trying to move the move the ball forward, you know, trying to do more, trying to trying to be tasteful within the context of playing as as hard as stuff and as complicated as you yeah. can, you know. So All right, so I'm going to ask this and if it's out there, I'll edit it and we'll take it out, but it feels like like I I know I I'm, I'm pretty sure right. Your players are the ones that put in all the extras, if, you know, they take music and it's like, oh, we can do this here, so we're going to add this in, whatever it is, like some kind of backstick or something like that, whatever. But there's so many groups that they're written, and it's just like some kind of gimmick, some kind of thing, you know. And so what how, like, it's like we're going to do this snare feature, and they're going to be, like, you know, standing on one foot and doing oh. all this. It, and not necessarily even from a visual standpoint, or it's like we're going to play these instruments that nobody's heard of, or we're going to rotate around a bunch of different instruments and spin at the same time. And, right. I mean, without being critical of that, what, it, it's ne it always seems like your, your focus is always going to be on the music, even in a visually driven activity. True. Yeah. So I think it has to start with that. But, you know, to be honest with you, um, my guys don't take a lot of the stuff like a lot of it is as written there's not a lot of like they don't do a lot to the music and sometimes it's kind of funny I'll actually write some stuff in and I, I, I remember last year I wrote some it was just absolutely inserted it's kind of as a joke and sort of like it was a totally 1970s backstick thing and it was funny because I knew that none of the players had any idea of what the, and they were like and they learned it wrong. You know, they, when they first learned the notation, they didn't understand what I was saying. I said, no, guys, it's like this, you know? And they, they kind of were laughing, the fact that it was, it was... But I think they found that to be really interesting. So I will actually think a, a plan, some of that stuff is, is all in there. Like, I spent an enormous amount of time working out the quad arounds, you know, and being totally logical about how it all fits. And I will, I will ask, often ask them... Um, does it work? Does this feel right? Does it feel natural? Uh, and then I'll, if, I, if there's some moment that I have a question about, I'll usually go up to one of the texts and I'll say, you know, you get what I meant there, right? And, and I, I, I wanted something like this and I'll explain it to them and then I'll, there's a certain amount of freedom for them to figure that out. All right. But other than that, it's pretty much detailed to the point. The older I get, the less has to be changed. I think that's absolutely a true statement. Whereas, you know, younger, you don't have the experience to rely on that. And so when you get older, I think 
I think I hit the nail on the head more often now uh, and less has to be changed. But as far as like extra non-musical things, um, you know, it's the world we live in. Yeah. You can't, I, I never want to be viewed as somebody who's stodgy or sort of like stuck in the mud or like that old guy on the porch telling kids these days. And now nah, I'm, I'm, I embrace it, you know, as long as it has some kind of merit. And the one thing I will say, and this is probably the most controversial thing I'll, I'll, I'll say about it is that it strikes me as strange to have like the five or six basic visual moves being applied to every possible style of music. You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah, like, yeah it's like doing the tango to right. music that's not, There's, yeah. Yeah, the whole like whatever it is, the shuck and jive and lift your leg up or do anything. It seems to be there's a limited palette of things you can do while you're wearing a drum. And now I'm more, I'm more embracing the interpretation of the music. Like as long as the visual stuff interprets the music. In other words, you're not, you're not fitting that square peg into that round hole. Like yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. Like oftentimes with the music, I'll ask the players, like, does it feel right to do this? Where does it feel where you should take a step and lean into it or do anything like that? And then we'll often sort of construct that like that. So it will be a unique visual thing that applies to only this music. And if we were doing different music, the visual stuff would have to be different. And so when I see similar visual things done, it does, it does smell a little bit of compulsory moves. Like you have to do this, even though it kind of doesn't fit or it doesn't interpret this music, right? If you see the same visual move to like, you know, some kind of driving sort of fusion music. And then you see like Tchaikovsky and they do the same moves. Doesn't that seem yeah, like yeah, there's yeah. something about that? I, th I think, I guess I'm optimistic. I think that will eventually evolve to work itself out over time. I think we're sort of, you know, we're, we're not in the very beginning stages of it, but we're, you know, it's kind of early. Like people will feel okay to, to understand what's tasteful and what's appropriate. So it feels like, I mean, as with everything else, anything else, it seems like the things make their way back. Like if a few years ago and even now, there's a lot of stuff that I remember seeing in the 80s or like... Little retro. Yeah. And so do you think the activity will ever go back? Do you think we'll ever have a time where the, all the drum corps are back in shakos and full-on uniforms? Or? No, I don't think so. And, and the reason I say it is because the way I feel when I see... Uh, uh, like a high school marching band mm -hmm. that still is wearing the polyester and the whole like, you know, honestly, it does look strange to me when I, after teaching um, for the, you know, SCV for the last three years or so where the uniform is radically changed, you can see the player. It becomes more about the performer. It becomes, it seems normal to me now. When I see somebody's face when they play, it seems normal to me. When it's hidden, it does seem kind of strange and it seems a little bit dated to me. So I don't know, I don't think we're gonna go back to the way it was. Um, and if, you know what, I could easily see a retro moment in a show, like an effect, like all of Costume a sudden- Costume change. Yeah, or like all yeah. of a sudden you did something in the show that was completely retro. Yeah, I could see that happening, but I think uh, in, in general terms, we've kind of gone there. Yeah. And I don't know if there's a way to go back. You know, Vanguard had, has an iconic uniform. They had they, you know, yeah. the Aussie and everything. Going through that transition, did it, did it feel strange at the time? It did at first. You know, the one thing that I thought um, made it easier for me was the response of the players, which I didn't expect, right? Um, you know, we had Aussies in the uniform and it was real, it was classic, you know, it was like really fun. And it was an attractive thing for the players to do is to wear the uniform. And it was an honor for them to do that. Yeah. Um, and so I thought there would be a little bit of a kickback. Um, but you know what, especially, I want to say for, for all the years, but especially like in 2018 when the uniform, it was just so comfortable. Like, you know, they, they, I would just, they would say the, the players were all, they all responded the same way. It was easy to put on, easy to wear, 
it was comfortable to do anything. Not as hot. Yeah, it I'm was sure. like everything about it was better. I think it looked killer. I loved, I loved the look of that core. Yeah. And uh, it just seemed simple and easy. And, and, you know, it wasn't so cumbersome. And so, you know, it, 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 it lacked the um, tradition but the things it gained were so much and 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 then the way they played you know was was that was the traditional thing was it was the performance quality and the one thing that is subtle that i'm not sure you you know is there is the star in the uniform somewhere yeah. oh yeah you know it's it's in there somewhere yeah and so it's kind of tastefully integrated into what's going on so it's not a total abandonment right so i i think it's okay yeah so did you wait? Did you bring the chucks, the red chucks, uh, NT? No, it was there before I got there. Okay, it was r- like right before I got there. Okay, the, the the start of the the group was kind of fundamentally based on the VK, you know, like it was fun, entertaining, not so serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And then you play your ass <laughs> off, and then it makes up for all of that. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, to anybody who doesn't know the activity, they, they come out and they see that. They're like, what are these guys doing? And then you start playing. It's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, they can wear whatever they want. You know? <laughs> Do you have a story you want to tell? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got so many of them. You know, I find myself, if I tell these stories, uh, then kids, they, you know, guys like us, you know, we would laugh and we would say, yeah, isn't that a great? And, you know, back in the old days and all that kind of stuff. But kids these days are like, they just look at me strangely and go, why would you ever do that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> right? So. Yeah. What about what's going on with Dynasty now? Because it's it's great. You know, honestly, I am I am never the guy to to really go overboard with promotion and all that kind of stuff. But I feel so good about it. I, th- I think the company went through some tough times um, two years ago. And it was kind of like, you know, it, I was always supportive of it because I was um, involved with the instrument design, you know, like the, the ground level of, deci- of, of the instrument design was always something that I've been really interested in. And it, was, it afforded me that opportunity to do it. And... Uh, you know, then they went through some hard times, which had nothing to do with, with the instruments. It was all just business, right? And so uh, the company, to make a long story short, the company was a little bit spread out. Certain things were made in certain areas, and it became difficult. Even the keyboards were overseas, and it became difficult to sort of manage all that stuff and make it work. And so uh, it went through some tough times and I contacted uh, a friend of mine that had been um, really successful with another business and was independently, you know, wealthy and, and sort of really successful in a, in a business outside of music. And his name is Roger Treacher. And I had dealt with him with, he tried to start uh, a senior corps uh, and it was, you know, located in my area and he talked to me and I was, you know, sure um, uh, agreed to do it. Uh, it was, so it wasn't like Drumline the movie. It was a, like <laughs> say yes to everything, right? And, and so um, it was a great experience. He was a great guy and, and just really wanted to make it work. It was, it's tough. Senior Corps is tough. You know, it's like a different schedule and it makes it difficult to attract people. But um, he had since split it off to for with a, a WGI percussion group and a color guard and you know and a brass ensemble and and it's kept it going and I remember uh, we've, we've talked throughout the years and he had tried to ma- uh, like distribute other instruments so I knew that it wasn't like a total shot in the dark and I said hey look this is this is a diamond in the rough this this can be really successful if it just had the you know, the right situation behind it. Sure. And I said, I think this would be perfect for you to get involved in this and try to do it. We could move the whole thing to one location. He had since started Titan Frames, which is a really successful frame company. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was like out of nothing. They just started it up and made it happen. He and his son, Luke, 
started this, this business and it seemed like it actually worked out seamlessly to, to so he acquired uh, all of the assets all of the manufacturing equipment and moved everything to Fort Worth everything is about three minutes from downtown Fort Worth and about 30 minutes from my house and it's all located under one roof Titan frames dynasty percussion uh, they even they went through a long process of getting the the code standards uh, for, from OSHA for to paint and stain drums and you know, there's a lot involved in and uh, you know honestly the quality is better than ever it's like the drums that we got last summer I, I kid you not we just out of the box put them on tune them up a little bit it was it was it was exactly the way I thought drums should sound like right out of the box and it was fantastic and it was really a testament to the the quality control and just the, you know everything about it and now we've delved into the world because we knew that we've had we had so many problems with the keyboards especially with delivery and consistency you know you never kind of knew what you get and it was just just the problem with delivery you know the timeliness of the sure. whole thing and so now we've gone way into the keyboard market and we I have um, a, you know over time over decades acquired lists of things that we can't stand about keyboards and my wife Sandy and I together are working on um, helping the design of these keyboards and so it's really a great situation. We can pretty much say whatever we want. And then Roger and those people, they, they tend to figure out how to make it work. So they implement anything. So there's no limit. And, there's, and the best part about it is there's, 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 there's not an instance where the answer is no. You know? It's, it's how. It's, how can we yeah, do it's this? never yeah. a no. It's like, you know what? And I just sort of casually said one day, you know, we just describe because, you know, we've sat around, Sandy and I have sat around the kitchen table discussing all the things that, that are problematic, which there are many, many things, right? Sure. And one of the big things was it takes two people to raise and lower a keyboard, the frame, for different heights for different players. You can't do it by yourself. You have to get your friend and kind of get over there and say, oh, I'm on number two. Can you get us number two? And then somebody almost loses a finger when the, right? Yeah. And we thought, you know what? If there's one thing that would be great is if, if it would just take one person to lower and raise a marimba. And I said, wouldn't it be cool if you just set a push button and went, right? Or you get on your iPhone. And do, sure enough, month, a couple months later, it's the frame is, uh, it's like we, we, we're trying to figure out what to call it, a digital smart frame, um, a Titan electronic keyboard frame, or, you know, there's, but the bottom line is you can control the, the, the height of the marimba with your iPhone app. One person with one finger can take it up and down. And it's truly amazing. It's a game changer. And then one other super fortunate thing was we got the world's best craftsmen with regard to Rosewood making the keyboards and tuning the bars and so the quality of the keyboards we're talking scholastic keyboards with a quality that's like a concert instrument like i feel you can tell i feel strongly about this this is absolutely um everything about it we just released the vibraphone at tmea and uh a friend of mine a colleague from another university came up and listened to me. he goes he, he said wow that sounds like it's amplified because of the the uh, the new alloy that we're using, it's just it, the pitch is is more pure and it seems to be more resonant and more. And, and honestly, one of the criticisms that I think that we all have to fight is, I can't hear the vibes. Yeah, oh yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so now that was one of the things on the list. Can't hear the vibes. Got to hear the. And so now, the 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 level that it maintains quality at the upper dynamics is really crazy it sounds really smooth and beautiful no more clanky sort of sound and it's really amazing i mean it really sounds like it's a no-brainer like right off the bat when you hear that instrument it's like wow this sounds like so is this what y'all are going to be using in the summer yeah completely and the vibe has the frame too awesome totally i got rid of the rod I don't know. I mean, for percussionists out there, you'll understand what I mean. Like the, the vibraphone rod yeah. thing that you forget to undo and yeah. bends when you, all of that is replaced with a, like a super tough nylon sort of strap 
that feels exactly like a rod. It does not change. But one thing that it doesn't do is it doesn't restrict. There's no like, there's no wing nut. There's no anything. Yeah. It's all just. Oh, that was the worst when the wing nut fell out and you lost it, and then you. Yeah, or the spring done. thing at the top. Yeah. yeah, it's just like how many, how many times have you played with a vibraphone that wasn't quite working? Yeah. And so this, the possibility of that happening is, is non-existent now. And if you lower the vibe, the vibe goes to a height that your seventh grader can play on it. I'm telling you, it's, yeah, like it's like that. We've solved so many problems. And if it goes down, you forget to do the, the rod, the, the, the strap thing just accepts the, Oh. yeah, okay. it's yeah, like, yeah. it's a no brainer. It actually works. And uh, we've decided you know how um, some vibes have the big bar across the pedal? Yes. Or, and then some have the more traditional right. pedal. We kind of have the best of both worlds. We have the swivel pedal with more real estate. Oh, okay, yeah. So yeah. it's not so awkward if they go to the... Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's for anybody who doesn't like one pedal or the other pedal. It's kind of the best of both worlds. But the, the other thing that was really great about it was the, the, the interest in making the frame. Um, if, you, if you look at a keyboard... There's more wood, there's more real estate, right? We spend so much time um, staining and lacquering our concert snare drums that the amount of wood on a marimba is like twice as much. Yeah. And so it's amazing when I did research that everyone just simply spray paints it black. Like create, it, it's like almost everybody uh, has like black hmm. rails and just it's all just, well, I think there's a couple of reasons. The, you know, the wood doesn't have to be that great of a quality because you're just going to spray paint it black. And so my interest was, let's make it the quality of a concert snare drum. Let's have it be like ash burl wood that's lacquered. And yeah. like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So they'll have like a really nice look to it. And it seems to be a waste of, uh, you know, a missed opportunity to not do that. So I think the, fi the one of the finishing touches, we're going to put like a really subtle fade on the wood. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it'll look really classy, like a really nice piece of furniture. And then we're gonna have five marimbas across the front. So it'll be, you know, the last thing, I know it sounds like I'm just pitching this stuff, but the last thing was would be uh, the fact that we're all gonna, we're gonna use five octave marimbas. And so the, the stipulation was we have to fit on the truck, first of all, like you can't, right? And then the, the, the the acknowledgement that everybody would like to use a five octave marimba, but the reason that we don't is typically, you know, a couple of reasons, and one of which is the size of the instrument sure. and the weight of the instrument. And so our five octave marimba is only four inches bigger than a low F of a uh, normal marimba. Yeah, like it's, nice. and it fits through doorways. And with the, with the frame that I was talking about, yeah. there's no stuff underneath the marimba. There's no crossbar, there's no anything. What about miking? We're right now, we're, we're, uh, we've got a couple of different options which are gonna be solved probably within the next week okay. about how to, how to approach it. Because you're right, there's no like extra stuff sure. that you can mount. Yeah. And so we're, we're talking about um, you know, many different things, one of which is like a suspended s system. Um, but it just, the, the other idea about the five octave room, it was like a high school, when they're purchasing a keyboard, they want, a, they want the nicest keyboard they can get. And in other words, everybody would like to use a five octave, but you're very conscious to, to not abuse it, right? And so when you get a five octave marimba, it typically gets in, goes into a room and it stays there forever and never moves. Maybe it's moved for the concert right, and that's yeah. it. And it's enormous amount of money. Right? And so the idea was we're going to have a five octave marimba that can be totally converted. And so right now it's got a front rail that can completely come off. And then that leaves the really nice wood and the uncluttered keyboard the way, the, the way it looks underneath. Yeah. It's got like a charcoal black resonators that looks really classy. And then it, it has uh, interchangeable synthetic and rosewood bars. So you could use your for both. Yeah. yeah, your five octave marimba outside and inside and, and not risk the fact that you're gonna ruin your instrument. And with the, with the one touch frame thing, you can raise it all the way up to go over speed bumps and do everything that. And for storage, you can lower it all the way down and it takes one person. And those are yeah. battery operated? It's your choice. It, 
Right. It's, it's, it's battery operated, mounted inside the keyboard, so you can't even see it. And it charges for 300 reps or something like that. Oh, so, nice. so it's rechargeable. Yeah, totally, yeah. Awesome. So in other words, you can go from top to bottom yeah, yeah. 300 times, which is probably like a season, yeah. right? Um, or you can have it plugged in and it's rechargeable. So you brought up something that I, it, it goes more to the playing aspect. You said you're gonna have five marimbas across. I always know that your pit setup, like we, we know what it's gonna be. Right. You know, it's not gonna be, sometimes we'll see pits on the back hash and yeah. thinking like, it's gonna be awesome. Um, what is it about, you know, you always have your marimbas up front, you have your vibe drive behind them, Tiffany's always over here, Sensor always over I here. I just find it, uh, I don't mind that standardization. Yeah. You know, the variety is the music. The constant in the equation is the instruments. See what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't mind that. I think it's, in other words, I'm not trying to be, I'm trying to be creative with the music. So yeah. I, know, I know the setup and I know what we have and I know there, there's a certain reliability. We know... Um, you know, we know what players are where, and we can orchestrate things to be specific to the players, and there's a standard setup to that that I don't mind. Sure. Well, I just looking at some, like, I get nervous if I have two vibes, like four vibes basically 40 yards apart. Yeah. Like, that makes me nervous, just looking at it. I, I mean, think that we just write for that, you know? I don't think, um, I, you know, we did... A presentation earlier today and I think one of the things I'm thinking of right now is the fact that a quote anything is not possible you have to write in a way that's smart for your ensemble and we number we have six vibraphones um, you know sometimes we we had five in the past but now we have six and they're divided in the middle by by the like the uh, the electronic cabinet and the xylophone and so there's a, there's a right and left to it for sure. And the parts are not, um, I think Sandy and I both value the same things in the fact that it's, we're not all playing the same parts, right? We're not all just trying to line up with the same right. things. It's all integrated and it's all conversational. It's woven together, there's certain textures. And, and so we're very conscious about where players are, you know? Yeah, her and I spoke about how you know, your group, there's a ton of, within the percussion section, there's a ton of counter melody, counter rhythm, you know, harmonic things happening underneath the melody. And, you know, she made it very clear, like, that's on purpose. That's on purpose to have many layers right. in the music rather than, because we were talking about how, like, sometimes you hear a drum line, and it's like everybody's playing the exact same rhythm, the exact same time, the exact same volume, and it's just like, right. Yeah. I personally think that if you have, all of the keyboards playing the exact same part, uh, let's say vibraphones to marimbas, that kind of doesn't happen in the real world. I, don't, yeah, I guess, I don't know if I'm making sense right now, but like a vibraphone player tends to play certain things yeah. and they have a natural sort of uh, palette of, there's, in other words, there's, there's a pedal, there's note length, there's, you know? Yeah. Um, there's certain, like, for example, like a Glock part, the, the density of the rhythm is not as much as you can do on a xylophone or a marimba. And it's just naturally occurring. That's the way the instrument sort of sounds best. And I think to blindly have people play the same things and double everything shows a little bit of lack of understanding of the difference of those instruments. I think we obviously know the keyboards intimately. We know what sounds best on each keyboard. And so I find it unusual that they would be playing the exact same thing all the time it sure can happen as an effect for a moment sure yeah but i find it unlikely that that's really the best use of those instruments like having your vibraphones all play the marimba part i don't know if that's really taking advantages taking advantage of the the actual instrument you're writing for knowing think, the instrument is key yeah i, I mean, think even i think you can see you know sometimes you have a vibe get off and go and hit some bass drums and another vibe get off and go you know what I mean and, and because you have they're not all doing the same thing they you know you have right. all your the back covered. row is 
it's pretty useful. You know, there, there's, like, I guess there would be more people in the back row than the front row because they, they, there's more variety in their parts. It's, you know, one person with the bass drum can make a difference. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Good and, and bad. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. So when you're adding players, you know, we have that, we have, you know, drum corps is a very territorial thing. People are very, they fight for the number of players they have. And we've, we've increased to 13 players in the pit. And I think, you know, we could have added another millophone or we could have added another player. But you know what? One person in the back row of the front ensemble can make a difference. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can trigger samples. They can hit a bass drum. They can hit a fa I mean, you're going to physically hear what they do instead of blending another player into a section with, with, that already has a bunch of players. And so, yeah, like each part is crafted in a way that we know that we, no matter what, we have to get to that symbol or we have to get to those, right? The xylophone player has a Glock like set up near them so that they can, sometimes they play both things at the same time. Yeah. I've set up, uh, the request back in 2015 was to set up a DTX, six of them to be added to the players to treat that like it is a, like Glock or a set of Crotales. So that any given time we can have a sample being played. Is that yeah. instead? And I think the question to me was, uh, was why don't you have all that with, with you know, like one person do all that? I, you know, I think it's cooler when you. Oh yeah, <laughs> right? totally. It's like a multi-percussion part that includes. Right. Uh, you don't want to have one element. one person right. at that level just standing there behind the electronic pad and being, you know. It's yeah. Just, it's just interesting. It's like, it's like adding a Crotale part to a marimba part. It's, sure. It's, it's interesting, you know. So are you aware that at one time there was, I know you're not a social media guy, but at one time there was a Facebook page called the Church of Paul Rennick? Somebody, yeah, somebody <laughs> told me about that. Yeah. I, I haven't really seen it, but. I, I don't know if it still exists anymore. I don't know either. Yeah. So, but what, what, like, what was your reaction to that? <laughs> I guess it, I guess it was positive because you know I think it's it's nice it's like just from a um, you know a human perspective that you're affecting people in a positive way. Sure. And uh, I think that you know I'm very I've always been very conscious of that ever since I start, first started teaching I wanted to make it a situation that was um, holistic, helping people you know yeah. from an educational standpoint and. Uh, talking about more than just the 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 you know the the musical part in the moment talking about bigger picture things and um you know creating a unity and a team-like environment sort of to you know i i felt like that you know when somebody told about the website it was it was neat because there was this generational thing that they all had in common you know and it was a situation i felt good about it because i created a situation it's a total culture thing. Yeah, yeah and, and cool. it just it just makes it seem like a positive thing that has affected people in a positive way. You know, um, have you ever thought about doing? Because you teach arranging at NT. Yep. Have you ever thought about doing something that's accessible to everybody? Yes, and I think we had we've had some discussions recently about um, about a video series of lessons. Nice. And and one of the. Uh, one of the f immediate things that comes to my mind um, is, is to do like a lesson series about arranging. For, for part of the reason is because I have the material because of teaching the class for so long, yeah. I have material that I could directly do with that. You do enough clinics over the years, you, you gain material, you know? You have to, when you present a clinic to people, or you, you have to organize your thoughts. And sometimes it's, you know, it's easy for you to do something, but it's not as easy to explain to somebody how you did it or what you thought about when you did it. So over the years, I've had to sort of streamline my thinking and to, to, to be in a way where I can communicate it to somebody in a very concise way. Technique, playing, um, drumming, the fundamentals of, of drumming, I can now communicate in a way where I think it's very efficient. Um, and I and I get my point across accurately. I teach another class that is uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, twice a week for an hour and a half. And uh, I think it's I think it's absolutely crucial uh, for 
the success of not only the students at school, but it's helped the drum corps season. It's a way that you can be behind closed doors and talk about things that you normally would not have time to talk about. In the summertime, you're warming up and you're, and you know what I mean? The cameras are out and the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a very, it's not a very intimate environment right. sometimes. Um, you can't sort of break it down and people can feel, uh, you know, for lack of better words, like vulnerable in, in sort of exposing errors and sort of fixing things. And, and that class at school is, is ideal. It's priceless when it comes to, it's, it's a mixture of a fundamental of drumming class and a music education class. You know, since I have kids, now I see all these kids as, as my children's potential teacher and it scares the death scares the life out of me right <laughs> and so now I, I it's all about it's kind of like about teaching people how to teach yeah and how to communicate effectively how to create situations that enable the player to play up to their potential and drum corps is notoriously um, guilty of not doing that creating situations that people play out of fear or out of fear of punishment yeah or out of you know, the reaction of teachers to students is often threats, mm -hmm. punishment. And, you know, it's, I, I am the opposite of that. I am literally the opposite of that. I don't do that at all. So. We, have a, we have a kid who just graduated. He's a, he was a wind player, and he marched two different drum corps. And I remember Dave asked him, how what, how'd it go? And he goes, it's just different. He's like, the first place I went to, it was more about showing me how to do it. And the, this other place was just like, well, you better do it or else. <laughs> <laughs> and Life so, threatening. Yeah, right. yeah, basically, you know. All right, last question is, have you heard of this thing called a Rennick rant? No, I haven't. You've not. never I've heard never of the Rennick rant. Apparently the Rennick rant oh, is, no. <laughs> is if something's not happening or maybe the, someone's not getting your point, you can go on for some time to <laughs> to get the point across can we experience a rennick rant right now no uh, <laughs> are you serious I, i'm serious hey oh, I, I i've never experienced it obviously but i'm being told that it, yeah i i can see that i can yeah i'll be uh yeah okay <laughs> I, I can be towards the end of a topic and then just say and another thing <laughs> and, and i'll just right what's wrong with the world today sort of thing you know i guess i don't know it has a good ring to it if it, like rennick rant. <laughs> i mean you could trademark it i think <laughs> it's all good intentions right no, right and, right of course and I, you know honestly i think that the players appreciate my talks you know i'm very honest with them and i'm very uh, honest in a way that's not personally threatening right. or attacking anybody but i just basically describe the environment today like, what, is things, what are things like today? You know, one of the things that I, I talked about recently was the fact that we, we live in an information age where you have access to as much information as you want at any time you want, right? I yeah. could ask you oh, yeah. for the recipe of yeah. some crazy thing and you could pull it up, right? I mean, there's this information overload almost. Yeah. There's nothing that you're, you're wanting or lacking and yet, yet music education is, it's, it's more than that, right? In other words, the teachers sometimes think like, if you only had enough information, you would just play better. In other words, if I gave you all the answers to the test, you would play. Well, they've got all the answers to the test. So what's the excuse now? You know what I mean? So I think that's what makes music so interesting to me is that it is it's a, it's like a vapor in the air. It's like music occurs in time, and it's almost like the 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 moment needs to be taught, right? Instead of the concrete thing or the technique or anything like that, it has to be. Um, there's a process in time of how to play, and you know the the things that surround the note of playing. And there's all sorts of nuance involved into it, so that. You can have all the information you want, but unless you understand the greater context or the subtleties involved in doing all that, you're, you still need teachers, right? The bottom line is you still need teachers and live instruction. Yeah. 
rather than like YouTube videos or Skype lessons or something. There has to be an interaction and a relationship between teachers and students that brings that out of them. And I think that's probably my one of my most recent rants. Yeah. I th- I, well, I think <laughs> I think it's um, it's 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 showing you care. That's right. what it is. You know, I mean, yeah. students may not realize Fair it. Enough. I mean, even even us at being at a high school, like you know, we'll sit a kid down, and talk to him, and he's like, "You see him squirming." It's like, no, I'm not telling you this to like, you know, bust your case. I'm telling you this so you yeah. learn something. Right. right. Yeah. You know, like it music can make is, a difference, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, music yeah. is it's what we teach, but it's also an avenue to teach many other things. Oh yeah, clearly. Yeah. yeah. And so that's what's cool about it. Awesome man. Hey, thanks Life so lessons. much. Yeah. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too.